Um, so this is a poem that I really enjoy uh, reading whenever I do an event at Cambridge, um, whether that's like with students or Kusu or wh wh wherever it is. And it's a poem that I wrote while I was at Cambridge. It's actually one of the very few that I have included in this collection from that time period. Um, but it, yeah, I, I enjoy it. I'll just read it and uh, I'll say that it was, yeah, it was based on a lot of my experiences with um, supervisions, uh, history, history supervisions, <laughs> and formals as well, I should add. Okay, it's called Didn't You Know? Didn't you know? White men invented everything. His rotting breath spills into my side of the room as he explains to me my humanity. He extracts my limbs from his teeth and deconstructs me on the table amidst cheeses I can't pronounce, as if I too can be consumed and finished off in the next round. He deconstructs and dissects in the same way they did so many continents, probably on tables just like this. But didn't I know white men invented everything? They didn't deconstruct, they constructed. Continents didn't exist without their toilet paper touch. I am not there. I am never there. I am not real outside of his gorged and purpling lips. Should I thank him then for mentioning me, for legitimizing my existence? He leans forward. As he does, another white man comes into view, a portrait just above his head, a mirror image minus several hundred years. You shouldn't talk only about race, he tells me. You have to consider gender, too. I don't know what to say in response. He wants a backpack for having just invented me, for having just created categories to fit my existence into. But his invention of me is my undoing. I cannot now exist outside his mind. I am boxed, I am trapped, I am being contained, contained in the same way that borders are just pen marks on paper, but also they are pain. And in boxing me, he splits me, segments me, and takes my voice. It used to be a joke that I couldn't finish my sentences, that I was always ready to be cut off, ready to be talked over, ready to be ignored. It used to be a joke that there was silence because nobody listens to silence. He tells me I am abstract, not one thing, but a series of disjointed reports, not real, just skin. Didn't you know white men invented everything? The boxes I am in are not my own, and the words of this poem are the only ones I know, but not the ones I chose to learn. Didn't you know white men invented everything? I look in the mirror and ask if I really know me, if anyone does, because whose performance am I and in what cage do I belong? I cannot talk only of race, but I cannot talk of gender too, for I am not two things. I am one. But didn't I know white men invented everything? The art of talking, the art of being one. They will lie to you that you cannot exist outside their mouths and thus you must come in bite-sized chunks, palatable. But he doesn't know that I have invented him. He is only white because I am not, and he is man because he calls me woman. I have invented him not because I need him only to make a point, but he, he cannot forsake me. For to forsake me is to forsake part of his white self that is so visible he thinks it invisible, that he thinks race and gender apply only to me. Weapons in his hands, they dissolve in mine. I am not there. It is he who is. He imagines me so he can breathe. He invents me so I cannot. Sometimes a poem is not enough because it is only words. And sometimes a poem is too much because it is words. But it is somewhere to exist outside their mouths. Um, so yeah, you, I think even when I read that, I can it kind of brings back a lot of very visceral recollections um, of just some of the strange uh, experiences, uh, kind of conversations where you're always having to defend or explain or justify um, your humanity. I suppose um, this next poem. Uh, in fact, no, change my mind. <laughs> Next poem I'm going to uh, read to you is um, one that I wrote after a... So I, I, I'm also an educator, as um, Maria mentioned uh, in my bio. I, I, do, I do a lot of speaking events and kind of talking on panels and that kind of thing. Um, and I remember I had been speaking at an event at King's College London, um, and it was... 
the themes were broad. It was sort of, you know, uh, we were talking about a lot of different things. It was a panel, wasn't specific to me. And afterwards, um, a woman, um, French woman came up to me um, and she asked me uh, a question. She said, can I ask you one question? I said, yeah, of course. And she said, um, if you had to pick one, which would you pick? Uh, feminist, human, or Muslim? And uh, this poem is my response. <clears throat> Muslim, feminist, or human? Pick one, she draws. Says one like it's a knife. Says one like I might fall. One with a loose O, a noose big enough for a small neck. Muslim, feminist, or human? I sterile laugh at the boxes, watch her eyes, watch me. No, this is a trick. A question especially selected, which mask will I choose? No matter, so long as it's not niqab. I sterile laugh at the boxes, say, that's absurd, a false distinction. She catches that with two hands. Kind eye clinically informs me that word, absurd, is very patronizing. That did actually happen. I wonder if she has ever been patronized. Wonder if she has ever been asked to split herself to reverse algebra, make her body a sum of parts, make herself less. Muslim, feminist, or human? The wrong answer would be Muslim. I know this. To see myself foremostly as a soul in submission. To see myself foremostly as beyond this life. To see myself foremostly in reference to Allah. To see myself foremostly as unable to see. The right answer would be human. I know this. To see myself for mostly as just like her. To see myself for mostly as citizen. To see myself for mostly as a nation state. To see myself for mostly as she does not see me. I wonder how that word tastes on her tongue. Whatever lies taste like, I'm sure. How can I give an answer that denies me? How can I accept a label that doesn't stick? Human until you're not. Universal rights until they're not. Conditional clauses for skins a shade less than worthy. Her eyes search my face, I search for a way out. To say feminist is to reduce myself to her whims. She will read it as save me. She will read it as guilty. She will read it as afraid. All the while I know her feminism is not for me. She wants to uncover me without seeing me, unwrap me only for the glimpse. Pick one, she draws, says one like it's a knife. Pick one, she draws, says one like I might fall. Pick one, she draws, one with a loose O, a noose big enough for a small neck. But won't you try it on with me, sister? Cut your human wrists with mine, bathe in this colourless blood we share. After all, we are not at war, are we? You are not holding a noose between your teeth. You are not making an offering of me, are you, sister? Sorry, I don't mean to patronise. Uh, yeah, more, more good memories. I thought that, that interaction was just particularly, I think, a really good depiction of uh, the kinds of experiences, you know, of just visibly being a Muslim woman in public spaces, um, the kinds of demands that people make of you. Um, and it's always through this very liberal framework, right? Like we're not racist, we're not fascist, we're not far right. Um, but at the same time, you must justify your humanity. And, you know, the fact that human was a, this extra option, you know, by default, I wasn't human, right? I had to I had to select it. And if I want to speak human, I couldn't miss them, right? And I think that, you know, so much is said um, in, in what she didn't say there. Um, I think that I would like to read, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm always really slow with this, sorry. Um, I think I'm gonna pick um, a, a different theme altogether. So a couple of years ago, I was commissioned to write a poem um, for the Conference of Theater Engineers and Architects, um, which is completely outside of my remit of knowledge really. Um, but they were interested in thinking about um, accessibility of theaters. Um, and you know that meant kind of structurally as well as um, how do you actually people I think people are a lot having a lot of conversations and we saw this some people are having a lot institution a lot of institutions are having 
kind of conversations about, you know, how are we complicit in racism after the Black Lives Matter uprisings, of course, um, and, you know, what they can do about it. And obviously most institutions just issued a statement saying, oh, we support Black Lives Matter, we think racism's bad, <laughs> and didn't kind of make any uh, structural changes, of course. Um, and I think this similar conversation has been having in, in, happening in theatre um, as regards to kind of how you make make theatre accessible to, um, you know, black and brown people, marginalised people. And there's always this assumption that, you know, we will invite them in, we will include them in, in theatre, which is, you know, this um, this art of the West, this art of, uh, you know, the Anglophone um, countries or, or even just like Europe, I suppose. But um, yeah, um, and no, no, I, no kind of like engaging with the theatrical traditions and performance traditions uh, and dance and music that, that have existed and oral cultures that have always existed um, in so many cultures around the world. And, you know, they're just not classed as theatre, right? Um, because it's not, you know, it's not seen as a legitimate art form. Um, so anyway, they asked me to write a poem. Um, and I kind of thought about my own experiences with theatre or going to the theatre. Um, and I also asked a lot of um, uh, people of colour, just young people of colour at the time. I, I sort of did a call out for people's um, experiences. So the experiences in this are not my own alone, but they are kind of a, a mishmash. So um, yeah, it doesn't really have a title. <clears throat> Act one, scene one. Small brown girl stands in a red jaw full of white teeth, tear upon tear. She appears uncomfortable, alone, dressed her best, but not good enough. Small brown girl sits facing the stage direction, laughs when others laugh, makes sure not to whisper too loud, slips secret Maltesers out of her bag, slips secret Maltesers into her mouth, makes sure not to rustle too loud. Pretends she is not affronted by the price of ice cream. Pretends this is not a birthday gift, but an everyday expense. Pretends. Small brown girl sinks into the dimming lights. Her act is almost over now. Because going to the theatre is the performance they don't review. There is no play so scrutinised as us. No costume designer so determined to get it right. Look the part, say, we belong here too. If a theatre is not a nation, why does the threshold feel like a border? Why are there border police? Why does going in make you feel like you could be kicked out? Act one, scene two. Small brown girl's mother ranked theater up with private schools and piano lessons, childhoods that could trick them into treating you better, could curtain call you into respectability. So small brown girl attended ballet classes but never made the cut. Small brown girl looked at listings where roles for small brown girls never showed up. Small brown girl spent weeks learning the steps to hairspray for the school production. It was in the title, hairspray. They said it just wouldn't add up. True story, sad, true story. Act two, scene one. Big white man asks small brown girl, are you in the right place? Are you lost? The cinema is two streets away. Big white man does not say aloud, but asks small brown girl anyway, how could you afford this? How could you be this? You are an imposter. Act two, scene two. White woman asks small brown girl, advise me on a play I'm writing. It's about a Muslim girl facing an identity crisis. What do you think? Small brown girl thinks white woman should write about something she knows about. Small brown girl thinks white woman's Muslim girl makes no sense. How is she on the stage when she can barely sit in the audience yet? But then again, theatres are full of applause that doesn't add up. Stories they say for one person, but packaged for another. They would rather standing ovation a version of me written by someone else than share my armrest. Act two, scene three, final scene. Small brown girl gets asked, will she perform a play for them? So she writes angry, clever, funny, draws them in, then spits them out. But afterwards, she thanks them for the opportunity, a justification for being here, a receipt to prove she's not lost. Small brown girl thinks it's funny to say thank you, when she still performs to a red jaw full of white teeth. She asks her friends to come watch her. Her friend says, I don't really care about theatre. Small brown girl wonders if that's the same as how her friend works full time, how her other friend has a two year old child and cleans part time, how her other friend lives too far out of town, how her grandma has bad knees, how her sister hates feeling like she's under a microscope and doesn't feel comfortable in spaces bigger than the living room. Small brown girl doesn't really care about theatre either. People tell small brown girl, you must write stories for the stage. But small brown girl wants to ask, for who? Her friends are all at home. 
Small brown girl stands in a red jewel full of white teeth, dressed her best but not good enough. Pretends she is not fronted by the price of ice cream. Pretends this is not a birthday gift. Pretends those are not border guards. Pretends, pretends, plays pretend. Pretending this could ever be for her. Um, as ever, there is, there is just not enough time to read all the poems that I wanted to, um, but I, I think I'll just read two more. Um, uh, yes, I will in fact do that. So this poem, oh, if I can find it, I always do this. I just think if I flick through, I'll, I'll land on the poem that I want to, and this is obviously just never how it works. So I will in fact have to use the contents page. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, a lot of those experiences are things that have actually happened to me and particularly um, the thing about people asking me to kind of read and give feedback on their plays and their plays about people of colour that are not by people of colour and, you know, in, to some extent, you know, why shouldn't we be able to uh, imagine the lives of other people? But when your imagining is entirely through a lens that's been applied to those people and you've never uh, spoken to or know those people, then that's when we enter murky waters. Oh, I found it. Page 62, looking at entirely the wrong place. Um, okay, so uh, I'm a Muslim, um, surprise. And uh, being Muslim is a really big part of who I am. And I think for a long time, it was um, something that I learned to hide away, to separate. You know, I wouldn't, when I came to Cambridge, I wouldn't tell people I was going to pray. I would just say, oh, I should be back in five minutes. Um, and I think there's been so much that I've had to unlearn. Um, and, and a big part of that has been really, you know, for, from a historical point of view, just learning that secularism is not this universal good that it's sort of said to be, and that it's a very local um, historical phenomenon that happened in Europe that actually is bound up with many of the Enlightenment ideas that were also the ideas that colonialism and slavery and genocide and theft are rooted in. So I think re-understanding secularism as this very specific um, organization of society um, that privatizes religious belief in order to kind of ensure certain political dynamics, I think really enabled me to, you know, re-experience faith on my own terms and to be much more unapologetic about the fact that yeah I completely believe that Allah is is my God and that there is a God and that that is the creator of the heavens and the earth and I don't feel the shame I think that I used to feel around you know being um, a person of, of religious faith um, and practicing um, and I think in the in the west in general there's this real binary that we play into of like the good Muslim and the bad Muslim so you know, we have this idea that like, you're probably watching me now thinking, you know, she's one of the good ones, right? Like, I'm just gonna presume project onto you. Maybe you're not, maybe you're like, you know, she's likely a terrorist, that's fine if you are. But there's a real binary where we have this idea that like, oh, you know, she speaks good English, she studied at Cambridge, um, yada, yada, yada. So she's, you know, she's one of the good ones, right? And she's not like those ones that are the bad, the terrorists, you know, the groomers, the barbarians, the uncivilized others, right? And this binary really just, doesn't allow for any space, right? And it kind of always justifies the policing of the good Muslims, right? All Muslims have to be policed in order to, uh, you know, make sure we catch the bad ones, right? And so you have policies like prevent all the counter-terror legislation that really works from this premise that we need to criminalize and suspect all Muslims because any of them could be violent in the future. Um, and so, you know, it just becomes this, this uh, process of social control. Um, I have a lot of poems in here about that specifically, um, but this one is more about kind of how that, the psychological effect, I suppose, of that impact of that. Um, it's called the best of the Muslims. The good Muslim is a compliant subject, stating no subjectivity, making no demands for state accountability, merely proving peacefulness and accommodating hostility. The good Muslim is a silent Muslim who worships for mostly acceptability. The bad Muslims are the extremists, the distorters and the radicals. They're told, come back to the middle, be balanced, be moderate. Without consideration that what's central is circumstantial and we must scrutinize the context before claiming it's correct. After all, is it not suspicious that moderate aligns so closely with liberal values? And holding liberal values happens to denote obedient citizenship. And obedient citizenship means be blind to colonialism. Don't complain about the racism. Neoliberalize your identity so modest fashion is enough. Integrate or deserve deportation. At the same time, tolerate dehumanization and know that anyway will never accept you as having fit in. Is it not suspicious that moderate Muslim fits so easily into Western analytical categories, ones which came into existence a millennia after the Quran? It's almost as if moderation has less to do with theology than hegemony, 
and more to do with worshipping the nation state than submission of the soul. I'd rather be a bad Muslim than a good Muslim, because such labels don't signify piety, they just distance us from the reality, masquerading as statuses with neutrality, bounding us, unbinding us, leaving us defined by external demand. So now the only good Muslim is a silent Muslim. The good Muslim is an excuse to condemn the rest. And all that really means is that in their eyes, if you want to be of those who pass the test, the best of all the Muslims is a Muslim who's not.